Uh, my name is Jeremy Holland, and um, I am delighted to say that uh, this book is now published and out after many years of um, cajoling, <laughs> verging on the bullying by Robert Chambers. Uh, we've now got the book out, and I'm absolutely thrilled about that. Uh, also delighted to see some of the authors in the room with us today. I see Niels Riemann Schneider from OPM, D. Jupp, who worked, who's worked in Bangladesh, uh, Carlos himself has contributed, so we've got good representation here. A quick round of thank yous before I uh, talk, and I'll talk for about 10 or 15 minutes and then hand over to Robert. First of all, thank you to Lina Payne at DFID Evaluation Department for helping to get this seminar off the ground. Thank you, Lina. Uh, thank you to uh, Robert and IDS for hosting the process of generating the book. And a big thank you to Andy, to Malcolm, and ODI for hosting this seminar today. Thank you. Um, let's go through the slides. Um, what I really wanted to talk, talk about to t in my section was just to run through what we mean by participatory statistics to illustrate a little bit of what participatory methods can do in, in generating statistics. Uh, and to flag up some of the methodological and process points that we perhaps will discuss in, in this panel session and also pick up later on in the technical session for those of you who are staying a little longer. Um, most, if not all of you, will of course be familiar with participatory research and this is a, has a long tradition, um, and participatory statistics in s itself now has a very long tradition, probably 20 years or more of methodological innovation. Um, and the, the case studies that are presented in the book, and I strongly encourage you to buy this book, um, are, uh, reflect the, uh, some breakthroughs and some innovations uh, and some exciting new approaches that have happened over the last 20 years. So it's, it's a kind of accumulation of that, of that process, but we also try and look forward in terms of the challenge of institutionalizing and mainstreaming uh, participatory statistics. And the book is organized around policy and program analysis, monitoring evaluation and impact assessment. So if you dip into the book, you'll see that the, the cases are organized around that sort of policy cycle. The book makes a case for a wider and more systematic use of participatory statistics. Uh, and the, the argument is that it's a win-win. In other words, it's a win for, for development agencies who are looking for accurate, timely, uh, efficient value for money data to help them uh, to design, implement, and monitor and evaluate policies and programs. Uh, and they're a win for local communities who, uh, through, their, through the process of uh, generating and analyzing data and statistics, uh, are empowered to take action and make changes in their own lives. So we have, on the one hand, real-time information flows for policymakers and program designers, aided by the increasing use of uh, new technologies, which give that just-in-time feedback, and, uh, and then an empowering process within communities and uh, for local people doing the analysis. So um, what are we talking about when we, when we use the expression participatory statistics? Um, well, if you look at this schematic, you'll see that at the bottom, <coughs> the bottom of the diagram, um, we have what are, what are described by Robert as embedded traditional methods. And that includes questionnaire surveys which use statistical sampling, standardized closed questions um, to generate uh, data that can be uh, generalized and inferred for a larger population. This is data that is verifiable, which you can trace, you can trace your conclusions back to the evidence. And it's the, it, we use the word embedded because that is the, the mainstay of statistical generation in international development. At the top of the diagram, you'll see participatory statistics. And this is described as new, even though I've just explained that this is a, a long time in the process. Um, but it, it has its origins in uh, community-based planning, local people identifying what their problems are and 
trying to identify solutions, sometimes with the aid of a, a discretionary budget at the local level. Uh, and it's evolved out of that origins into something that actually has now a claim to uh, greater uh, significance in terms of aggregation, standardization, and inference beyond that local population. So participatory statistics has brought participatory research out of the very contextual origins to a more uh, standardizable um, uh, and aggregatable, if that's a word, uh, use in statistics. But what is uh, what remains the same uh, with participatory statistics as with participatory research in general is that it is, it is group-based and visual. And that is very distinct from questionnaire surveys which are use, use individuals' uh, respondents to answer closed questions. Group-based means that you have a group of people, um, the more socially homogenous the better, sitting in a room um, discussing a particular issue. And visual means that they're using a, a suite of tools that have been evolved over time and which rely on um, pictures, uh, stones, seeds, uh, drawing, and other visual methods to bring that data to life. The, the group uh, in your picture is uh, a group of women in Ghana. Uh, and I see Ramla here from OPM who is with me on this particular research. Uh, these are beneficiaries of a cash transfer program uh, who are the, the very the most vulnerable women in their communities. These are women who, are, who have been targeted and identified as, as uh, passive recipients of, 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 of a, a targeted cash transfer. The, this analysis puts them at the center of the analytical process. They become the local experts. They become empowered to uh, describe analyze, evaluate their realities on the ground. So this is an example of how participatory research reverses learning and encourages us, the so-called experts, to listen to people on the ground doing their own analysis. Now group-based learning um, with participatory statistics um, is particularly useful, and I think Carlos will pick up on this later, when we talk about public knowledge or community-owned knowledge. This is where a group of people in a community act as key informants uh, in mapping uh, and describing particular characteristics of their community based on the fact that that data is public knowledge. And this is what allows us to generate essentially a census or saturated sample of data for a whole community very efficiently using a small group of key informants. You can also work with groups to generate data that is individual to a particular person. In other words, they become one observation, if you like, in a, in a statistical data set. And that involves them doing their own analysis as individuals, but then sharing that analysis and discussing it within a group. So you combine the individual data collection of a household survey with uh, the group-based analysis that's so powerful in participatory research. Participatory methods have been developed over many years, and this is a, a, a list of the, just a few of the, the methods and tools that can be used uh, for generating statistics. People map, they model, they use proportional piling, they use ranking and scoring, and through those methods they generate different types of data. And th those statistics come in different forms and in different combinations. So if you look at that list, you'll see when you see a method being used, more often than not, that method actually g generates or, uh, data, different types of data in combination. And what I'm going to do is, is give you a few examples to illustrate the use of participatory methods. This comes from ongoing work on the cash transfer program that I just mentioned, which is a six-country study in, in, uh, in Africa. Just to, this is not in the book, but it's to try and show you that this is ongoing work. We're, we're still evolving and still working with participatory statistics. So the first example um, is the use of estimating, and this is combined with valuing and scoring. Estimating often uses participatory uh, proportional piling, where a group of local experts take a, a group of 10 seeds or 100 seeds and uh, allocate those seeds according to different categories. In this case, a group of women in a market town in Ghana, in central region, um, listed and then 
allocated seeds across different types of livelihoods for women in their community to estimate how many women or what proportion of women work in different types of livelihoods. And this process um, becomes very accurate, and this is a, a point that I'm sure Robert will pick up on, because when you have a group working with seeds in this way, you have what, what he calls successive prox approximation, um, group visual synergy, where you see the participation, participants in the group correcting each other, and, you, and the process of allocating the seeds becomes subject, subject to heated uh, debate and discussion <coughs> until it gets to a point where, where the group are happy with that estimation. And the, the women then valued the different livelihoods in terms of categories that have been identified. Uh, and the data that resulted from that particular group discussion can then be put into a, uh, a matrix. So you can see the occupations, the percentage of women involved in each occupation, uh, their average monthly income, and then valuing by scoring different characteristics of those livelihoods in terms of risk, reliability, and overall preference. So this is a data set that can be, take, to be used internally within a community for analysis and can be extracted and used externally by development agencies and others. <coughs> this is another method called wealth ranking, and this is a method that was used uh, a lot uh, in the early 90s by Andy and others at the World Bank when, when the, the participatory poverty assessments were uh, being conducted. Uh, and it involves, again, proportional piling. Uh, a, a group of local experts uh, identifies different categories of poverty in their community. They identify, uh, th they list the characteristics of each poverty or wealth group, and then they start to allocate seeds across those groups to estimate uh, what proportion of people in their communities uh, s sit within each group. And in this case, uh, in the context of a cash transfer program, the discussion then led on to uh, an analysis of to what, it, to what extent the cash transfer had impacted on changes in poverty status of the individuals, to what extent the cash transfer was actually targeted at the right people, and the explanations for why people were moving between wealth categories over time. So that kind of analytical and evaluative discussion led on from the act of proportional piling. So in this case, they, they started off with a, a group of with three different uh, categories and then uh, over a period of 20 minutes or half an hour they then discussed and ended up with a more sophisticated uh, group of um, wealth categories and that then generates another matrix where you have on the left hand column um, uh, local <coughs> local uh, characteristics of poverty or local definitions of poverty uh, the proportion of people in each group and then the characteristics of those of those people The next, I think the, the final illustrative method I'm going to show you is household income and expenditure analysis. And this was done in one of the other cash tra transfer uh, countries, Kenya. Uh, whereas uh, wealth ranking, as I just described it, uh, is based on locally identified categories of poverty and is, is therefore very contextual and not appropriate for aggregation and cross comparison across communities. Household income and expenditure analysis uh, uses individual observations where people um, estimate their income and expenditure as individuals using a, ca um, a category of income sources and expenditure types which are generated out of the participatory process. So the participatory process generates those categories. They are then standardized and uh, individual beneficiaries in this case estimate their income and expenditure creating a data set that can be standardized and aggregated, and which in, in sampling terms is a, a, you have a cluster of sam cluster sampling where you have a 10 or 20 percent um, sample of beneficiaries, in this case in, in, in the sample communities, generating individual data. That individual data then, um, f then segues into a group discussion about income and expenditure, what has changed since the introduction of the cash transfer, uh, how, how it has changed and why it has changed. So you'll see that I'm flagging up with each of these methods the way that the, the data generation stimulates the analytical and evaluative discussion within a group, and that's the power of these tools. 
while also generating data that can be extracted and used by outside policymakers and program designers. In this case, that data was then extracted and converted into box plots which show uh, the distribution of income across those categories that I talked about uh, uh, for, for income, comparing two districts in Kenya. Uh, I, I, Ellie Fisher was involved in this research and, and she, she knows uh, that, that, that these districts were very different in terms of their context and the, the, the wealth and the livelihood opportunities of the people in those two districts. And that's reflected in the way that people use, uh, raise their income and spend their money. And the same, the same was done for uh, expenditure, um, comparing the distribution of expenditure and, and expenditure across uh, between the two districts in Kenya. So I want to finish by raising um, a number of points for discussion. Uh, these are points that represent claims that we make in the book about participatory statistics, and they also involve trade-offs. If you, if you dig down, you'll see that there are trade-offs involved in this, and that, <coughs> that needs to be thought through and, and discussed. Um, the first, the first is more of a process point, which is that uh, the claim in the book is that participatory statistics can accommodate both participatory process and data extraction. Participatory process is that process of supporting uh, reflection and action in the best tradition of participatory research, which takes time and effort, rather than a p turning up in a village in a four by four, grabbing the data and then disappearing in a cloud of dust, you spend time with groups facilitating their discussion about what the data means for them and how, what action they should be taking. So when you start to go for more breadth in order to improve the precision of your inference uh, from a sample, sampling perspective, then you spend less time in each, in each village. Second point is that uh, participatory states can accommodate both contextual and externally valid data. And I think I've tried to make that point in illustrating the methods today is that uh, a lot of the analysis is contextual and should remain contextual. Other, other elements can be standardized uh, in, order to, in order to be aggregated and compared across populations and over time. And you can, of course, come up with hybrids where you have some standardized data that you're collecting and some contextual data. So I think that's something that, that has been thought through carefully and, and illustrated in the book. Third point, and I'll just, I've got a couple more minutes. Third, the third point is that um, Participatory statistics can capture both the quantitative and the quantified. And I think this is a point that Claire's will pick up, is likely to pick up on, uh, that, that participatory statistics enable local people to value that which is intrinsically qualitative, to put a score on something which is intrinsically qualitative. And that often is around relationships. So Niels in, in, uh, in the Maldives was understanding how uh, health users and, and school children and parents, their, their perception of the, of the s and satisfaction with the services provided by scoring. Uh, D. Jupp in Bangladesh was working with a, 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 a social, a land rights social movement who were identifying and defining what empowerment meant to them in terms of changes in their social, political and economic lives and then placing a value on how empowerment in its various dimensions has changed in their life. That's an act of scoring. There are a number of uh, chapters in the, in the final section of the book which similarly look at how interventions uh, around uh, drought in Ethiopia, uh, targeted inputs programs in Malawi and others, how those interventions are valued uh, by local people in terms of the effect they have on their lives in different dimensions. Um, the, the last, the penultimate point is, is, is a very important one. Participatory statistics powerfully merge described change with analysis and evaluation. And this is the point I've already made, which is that you have this description of change which feeds into uh, a discussion about what has changed, why has it changed, and how good is that change. And that is absolutely crucial. David Booth, uh, an ODI uh, staff member until recently, um, has previously written in, a, in another edited book about qualitative and quantitative research. And he, he suggested that strong fences make good neighbors. In other words, <coughs> quantitative people should stick to what they do best, qualitative people should stick to what they do best, and then we should try and merge them as best as possible. Um, 
I increasingly see uh, in my work that that fence can become quite a barrier. And, and I, I've sat in, 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 in meetings where uh, survey results have been described with some uh, meager attempt at interpretation, and then uh, qualitative uh, research is described in, in all its richness, and uh, the, the, the gap between those two disciplines remains uh, not unbridgeable, but very significant. So you, you're kind of peering over the fence and thinking, what the hell is going on over there? You know, wh why did that survey come up with those findings? It doesn't seem to bear any resemblance to, to what I've done with my qualitative research. And on the other side of the fence, they're thinking, well, this is all great qualitative stuff, but it's just an, an anecdote or a case study, and we, we really we want to stick with, with our data. What I found with participatory statistics, and given the, this new move to try and strengthen the statistical sampling elements, is that you can combine the generation of quantitative data with the evaluative and analytical qualitative data. And that provides a very powerful combination, which I think actually uh, justifies reducing that <coughs> fence a little bit between the quant and the qual. Um, finally, um, uh, I want to end with a little story about uh, motorcycle mammas. Uh, this is to illustrate the point that participatory statistics can help establish the internal validity of qualitative insight. Howard White uh, has talked about data mining. He's talked about how um, researchers in both quantitative and qualitative traditions can try and find what they want in the data. And I'm just going to quote. He says, the data analyst is looking for the interpretation most consistent with the data, i.e. letting the data tell the story. The data miner knows what she's looking for and keeps digging until she finds it. Then she stops and that's the story she tells. Okay, now this is both a quantitative and a qualitative phenomenon of data mining. What, what we found with participatory statistics is that with a sufficient sample size in the community, you can actually set out the range of variability within that community in terms of, for example, with the cash benefit transfers, what people earn and what they spend. That gives you the range of variability. The story that you tell then becomes a story that represents the majority experience or the typical experience. The qualitative insight is anchored to that range. Yes, you can tell stories of people who, are, who did unexpected things, and that's also important in qualitative research, but you know where your range is. The motorcycle mama story was a... <coughs> my last minute... Um, an, an anthropologist from the clients we were working with came into the field with us, and <coughs> she, had, she, was, she was looking for a story about the transformative impact of cash transfers. She wanted it to show that this was enabling people to build up their assets, to, to generate transformative livelihood strategies, and, and sort of power their way out of the, their poverty trap. And she, came, she pounced on this story of motorcycle mamas, a group of women in one village who had used their cash transfer, pooled it, and started a motorcycle taxi company, okay? This was classic, classic sort of journalistic data mining of a, a story that was way outside the range of experience of, of most cash, benefit tran uh, cash benef beneficiaries. And by using those participatory statistics, we were able to rein her in. We were able to rein her excesses in, right? Mm -hmm. and, that, that, and, that and, that was, and that, for me, brought home how, you can, how, you, how statistics in that way can, can, can be a, a powerful force in generating valid and accurate data. Um, thanks very much. Uh, Robert will now continue um, based on his afterword in the book and looking particularly at how we, the challenges we face in trying to mainstream institutionally and methodologically participatory statistics in the future.